Tim, welcome back to Computer Files. Slightly different circumstances. We were doing mega fave numbers in the last one, right? That's right, yes. I was talking about my favorite number, um, which many people were disappointed I didn't know by heart. Um, but it is still my favorite topic to talk about, big numbers. Um, in that video, I mentioned uh, prime numbers in particular. Uh, the big number I selected for that video was a prime number. And I said, I'll come back and talk about how they relate to computer science. Prime numbers in computer science are interesting for various reasons. Um, one of them is it's not always easy to find whether something is a prime number or not. Um, if I give you a number that like 91, can you instantly tell whether it's a prime number or not? Um, then again, if I tell you that 7 times 13 is 91, you can quite quickly verify that that's right, and therefore 91 is not a prime number. Um, so there's various shortcuts that people found to quickly be able to determine whether something is a prime number, uh, but no one has found a shortcut to be able to find the actual prime factors. So telling that 91 is not a prime number is fairly easy for a computer to do. Finding the number 7 and 13 is relatively difficult. Of course, I say relatively here because for a computer it's peanuts to find 7 and 13. Um, so that makes it interesting for computer science. Um, but what makes it even more interesting is its application. Um, its application is mostly in cryptography. Uh, if I want to communicate in secret with you, um, then I want to be able to do that. Uh, so one example of where prime numbers are used in cryptography is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which is something that Mike Pound was uh, spoke about about three years ago on this channel. A very interesting video, watch it. But another important application that uses prime numbers is RSA, which stands for Revest, Shamir, Edelman, the three developers of the algorithm, and it's heavily based on, on prime numbers. We see RSA everywhere, don't we? It's, it's connecting to the internet. We are almost always using RSA at some point. Is that, would I be right in saying that? Exactly okay. right. Yes, thank you. Um, so public key cryptography is the general class that RSA is in. There was a video about this a long time ago by Robert Miles, and he explains what public key crypto is. But one of the most important modern applications, uh, I would say crucial to the internet, is the fact that HTTPS is built on top of this kind of technology. Now, there are two main flavors to implement it. There's RSA, which is the older, more established algorithm, and there's elliptic curve cryptography, again, a topic of a different video. And those are basically the two competing algorithms. And of the two, RSA is based on prime numbers, which is why I'm talking about those today. In fact, I would like to give a quick demonstration of how RSA is used by going uh, to our university's website. So the browser I'm using is Firefox, but all browsers will have this functionality. And what you can see is this little padlock in the top left next to the address, which means that your connection is secure. Now you can actually investigate how the connection is set up by clicking on the padlock, clicking on the right buttons, and then here's a button that says more information. And then there's the option to view the certificate, which is what we're going to do now. And here we see information about the certificate and the relevant information that I want to talk about is right here, public key info. And so it says the algorithm is RSA, which is the algorithm I want to talk about. It says something about the key size being 2048 bits. Then it says exponent, which is roughly 65,000. And then there is this number, which is the modulus, which is a massive number. It's cut off here in hexadecimal. And if we translate this to a decimal number, the number we end up with is this number. So what you end up with is this 600 digit decimal number. It's a massive number and it's not a prime number actually, but it is the product of two very, very large prime numbers, uh, two 300 digit prime numbers. Now the idea is that nobody knows what these two prime numbers are. If you can figure out what these two big 300 digit prime numbers are that make up this larger number, I will offer you a fully funded PhD and a guaranteed spot in the newspapers and um, perhaps even a big price here and there. 
Um, and on top of that, you get to hack the Nottingham website. But how come that this idea that it's difficult to find prime factors actually lays the foundation for a cryptographic protocol? In order to explain how it works, we need to talk about a slightly different topic first. It's called modular arithmetic. Now, it sounds complicated, but it's actually very easy. In fact, we do it every day if we're using an analog clock. Because a clock, every 12 hours, it goes back to its original position. So if I ask you what is 15 hours on the clock, you will know it's three hours because it's the remainder after division by 12. We do it often for 24 hour to 12 hour clock conversions, but you can even do things like minus one hour, which would be 11 on the clock, or 25 hours, which would be one on the clock. Now the clock we are going to be talking about is not a 12 hour clock, but a 91 hour clock, because 91 is the product of the two prime numbers we're interested in. The magic that actually happens is that if you think of a magic number between 0 and 90, then I can instruct you to take that number and raise it to the fifth power. So can you think of any number? Should we go for, let's go for number 18. Okay, 18. So what I instruct you to do is to take the number 18, raise it to the fifth power, but do that on a 91 hour clock. So this is like 18 times 18, five times, and then maybe do it on the say... clock. So it will always be a number between zero and 90. For a human, this is a bit complicated. I don't expect you to know the answer, but the answer will be 44, which is, you know, it's a normal number between zero and 90. And then what I do is I take that number, 44, and I raise it to the 29th power so I multiply it with itself 29 times on the clock, and the number I end up with is 18. So I know in normal ar arithmetic you have this idea of inverse operations. Is that a bit like that? Have we got back to the start doing that? Yes, that's exactly right. So 29 is a magical number that we found that will reverse your doing the power to the f taking the number to the power 5. So whenever you take a number to the power 5, if I take that result to the power 29, the result I end up with is the original. And it will always be the case on a 91 hour clock. So that's something special about 91 hour clocks and I know they're different numbers for different clocks. That's right. So it's a special property of 91, 5 and 29. And if you can figure out that the number in question is the number 29, you can read the secret messages. So it is important that no one knows the number 29. Um, so let's, there's three questions we can ask ourselves when, when we see this equation. The first one is, where did the magic number 29 come from? How did we get that? The second one is, how does the uh, computation work? Why does it reverse the operation? And number three is, is this secure? Why is this secure? Let's answer question one. So question one is, where does the magic number 29 come from? Now, to see where it comes from, we need to construct a different clock. So we had a 91-hour clock, which was constructed by multiplying the two prime numbers, uh, 7 and 13. We're going to construct the different clock by taking the number before the prime number. So 6, because it's 7 minus 1, and 12, because it's 13 minus 1. Multiply them to get 72. So we're going to work now in a 72-hour clock. And then... We're going to pick a prime number which does not divide 72. So we're not allowed to pick 2 or 3 because they divide 72, but 5 is allowed. So let's say we pick the number 5. That is our encryption value, E. Uh, and that is the 5 that we saw before. We took 18 to the power 5. So that's an arbitrarily chosen number to some extent. Uh, but the number 29 is not arbitrarily chosen. Because what we want to do is we want to value, find a value d such that e, in our case 5, times d is equal to 1 on our 72-hour clock. Now, finding that by computer is very easy. It uses an algorithm called the extended Euclidean algorithm. I'm going to give you the answer because we know what the answer is going to be. It's 29. A computer can find it quickly. And indeed, if we multiply 5 times 29, 
what we get is 145, which is one more than 144, and 144 is a multiple of 72. In other words, 5 times 29 is indeed equal to 1 on a 72-hour clock. And this is where that magic value 29 that we used before comes from. So that brings us then to the second question. How does it work? We came up with this magic value uh, 29, um, and it, uh, it has a property that 5 times 29 is equal to 1 on our uh, 72 hour clock, right? Um, so what this means is that if we subtract 1 from 5 times 29, what we end up with is a multiple of 72. Now, let me just tell you what e times d is without any clocks. It's 145. So on a 72 hour clock, okay, we go once around, we go second time around, and then we have one hour more. Okay, works perfectly. So if we subtract one, we end up with the number 144. So um, five times 29 minus one is a multiple of 72. But that also means it's a multiple of this number six, which is seven minus one. And it's a multiple of uh, 12, which is 13 minus one. So ED minus one is a multiple of both our, uh, our left prime number minus one and our right prime number minus one, seven and 13 respectively. Now, because it is a multiple uh, of both of those numbers, for each of them individually, we can uh, apply a theorem known as Fermat's little theorem. Uh, Fermat was a famous mathematician uh, living hundreds of years ago, never having heard of cryptography, of course, yet his results are very useful today. So using that, we can actually deduce that this value m to the power ed minus one simplifies to one on our clock. Now, because we have this minus one, we have one little m left over, so what we end up with is 1 times m, which is m, uh, which is how it cancels out in the end. Okay, so that's quite difficult to, to follow, I would say, um, but it's quite elegant. Like things that are not clear somehow fit together as puzzle pieces and they all cancel out and what we end up with is exactly our original value. Now there's one remaining question, is it secure? So we know that it works, we know why our magic numbers are chosen the way they are, but the question is, is, is it secure? So how come that I, as in this case the University of Nottingham, am able to deduce this value d, but strangers cannot? Now if we look at the way in which the magic numbers were chosen, remember that we found the number 72 by taking one prime number 7, subtracting 1, and the other prime number 13, subtracting 1, and multiplying them. How will you do that if you don't know the prime factors of 91? So you cannot find number 72 simply because you don't know the prime factors of 91. And we established in the very beginning that finding prime factors was a difficult problem, but computing a number which consists of two prime factors is an easy problem. So the University of Nottingham came up with two 300-digit prime numbers, multiplied them, which was relatively easy, found the numbers E and D, the magic numbers, and then forgot about the prime numbers because they are no longer relevant. And then it's secure because only people that have the numbers P and Q will be able to deduce the secret magic numbers. And nobody else can know the magic numbers. If I go to the site, will I see those same magic numbers? Do you see what I mean? So you will see two of the three magic numbers, which is the product P times Q, but you won't know what the original values P and Q were. You will see the number E, which in our uh, little problem was the number five, but you will not see the other magic value, which in our example was the number 29. So the number E is usually a small number, and the number D is usually quite a large number. So that's why we found uh, for Nottingham that the number E was 65,500 something, but the number D, which is a secret number, could really be any number that is roughly 300 digits long. We have no idea which number it is. You're not going to be able to search them all. Our cues quite quickly, it's 2 to the 16 operations, 65,000 operations, even on a laptop, not going to take very long. So I go through and I find all the possible 
axes. That means that any device which is keeping track of time in that way will get really confused and we basically get the millennium.